This is St. Clair County, Illinois, a conservative farming community. People here are hardworking, religious, and private. The notion that the witnesses of this UFO would fabricate a hoax or even misidentify a commonly known aircraft is not even worth considering. There's no doubt that the witnesses of this UFO saw a triangular-shaped aircraft, approximately a football field in length, and it moved in total silence. On two occasions, it achieved a rate of speed which left the witnesses dumbfounded and unable to understand how a massive object could relocate itself miles away in a matter of seconds. Maybe two to three seconds tops, two to three seconds tops, because it was a case I was outside, I was watching, then I reached in to get the mic, again to let CENCOM know, because our portables aren't that reliable. And when I got back up to tell him, I looked, and it, it was already over Shiloh, and that's about six to seven miles away, which again was approximately one and a half, two miles north of Scott Air Force Base. Uh, the whole time I saw it, I had my windows rolled down, and I, had, I didn't have the radio going or nothing like that. And the thing, it, it was just like, it was just a slowly, it was just like a slow moving when I saw it. And I was only at the time going probably about 20 miles an hour or so in my car. And as I pulled over to get out of my car, it was like just within the snap of the finger, it was way down, you know, way down the other side of town. And, you know, I just stood there and looked at myself, you know, I'm like, okay, it was just here, and now it's way down there. How did it do that? And it was amazing. And there was no and sound? Not a sound at all. None whatsoever. There was no way to, to uh, have that to be that low without hearing something. Even if they were gliding in, I mean, there, there would have been noise. I mean, the wind, you could hear the wind from it. And so in all this here, it was so quiet. I mean, nothing. Even the treetops didn't even move because I looked and there was nothing. And so if you wouldn't have been looking up, you wouldn't even know it had been going over you. I, I never shut my patrol car off at any time, but I did exit my vehicle when I took the picture, and, and I could hear coming from the vehicle, it was a low-frequency buzzing noise, uh, almost sound like a low-frequency, like a, a transformer on an electrical pole would make, only a little lower decibel than that. I could hear as, as, it, as it passed. As it went off, I, you know, lost the sense of the sound, of course. But. Being a military brat for 21 years, and being an aircraft anyways, I can pretty much tell you what kind of plane it is by the engine noise. And then I figured I would call Scott myself and say, hey, look, you know, we got some pilot hot dogging out here, that kind of thing. And there was no noise, none. And when I read reports that the military was saying, well, if it was a B-2 with its flaps down, blah, 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 well, okay, that's fine, but they still make noise. I mean, that's, that's the most, but yeah, they, you can't see them on radar, but they make noise, all aircraft that I know of. And again, I don't know of all the R&D aircraft. However, all the ones that I do know of, they make some kind of noise. The witnesses testified that the UFO was enormous in size, as large or larger than a 747 jetliner, which is 231.9 feet in length. The notion that the UFO was a B-2 bomber, which, although it has a wide wingspan of 172 feet, is only 69 feet long. The B-2 can be ruled out as a possible explanation. Where I was, I was on a, on a high a hilltop, and it was an open field, so, you know, there was nothing, you know, that could obscure my view. I mean, it was very clear sight. I could actually tell, like, some kind of figures on the bottom of it, as in uh, some kind of a style of crafting or, some, or, or steel, uh, almost like I said, uh, building blocks were put together. It just almost looked like it was put together in pieces. It, it wasn't one uh, smooth uh, bottom. It, it, you know, it's like almost like pipes mm -hmm. is, is, you know, when you do it, putting your plumbing together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to explain. It, it's like it tried to camouflage itself against the night sky because you could tell it was black and metallic in color, but you could almost, like it was trying to project the star field above it on the, uh, on the underside. After subjecting Officer Stevens' photo to computer enhancement, no outline of the UFO could be defined. However, when the blurred streaks of light from camera movement are removed, the three brightest lights noted in Officer Stevens' sketch can be discerned in the photo. Only the centered light is skewed due to camera angle, 
which can be resolved when an illustration is superimposed over the photo. Both Lebanon Officer Barton and Milstadt Officer Stevens' sketches reveal an array of white light across the rear of the craft. One can theorize that the UFO's light sources are linked to some kind of propulsion technology. The question is, whose technology? The U.S. Air Force isn't claiming it. The UFO came to within one mile of Scott Air Force Base, and during the sighting, St. Clair Police Dispatch called Scott Air Traffic Control and asked if Scott could see the UFO. Scott Tower responded that they saw no UFO on their radar. Yet later, Scott personnel told newspaper reporters that they knew nothing about the UFO because their tower and radar were shut down. A very convenient and very unlikely story, especially since a military cargo plane was seen flying over the area only 15 minutes before. So why does the Air Force continue to deny all knowledge of UFO activity? I think the government's having the same trouble we are. And I think that maybe that's the reason they're not telling us much about it, because they can't explain it. That is one of the reasons, I think, that they may not be telling us. There are others. I think some of the other reasons that the government doesn't tell us is because the world isn't really ready for a complete explanation, because the complete explanation is going to go email everywhere. And that's going to be a real shock to a lot of people to their psyche, to their religious belief, to their sense of reality and who they are. Thanks to the internet, individual civilians and UFO investigative organizations are posting a lot of information on the World Wide Web. One such organization is the National Institute for Discovery Science, or NIDS, based in Las Vegas, Nevada, which investigated the sighting and posted their complete report on the web. NIDS checked into every possible man-made hypothesis for the Illinois UFO. Theories included a so-called stealth blimp posted on a popular mechanics website and an Arion hybrid inflatable lifting body. Neither craft could be confirmed to exist and they can be ruled out due to their inability to reach the speeds observed by witnesses. Also, such speeds would create g-forces in the tens of hundreds which would damage both the airframe and the passengers. Because the UFO made little or no sound, we must turn away from conventional prop jet engine and rocket propulsion to consider a cutting-edge technology called electric propulsion. Jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, pioneering EP research and development is underway at universities and aerospace engineering laboratories around the world in the production and testing of various types of ion and plasma thrusters. Atomic-based propulsion was researched in the United States in the 1950s, but as of the year 2000, the physics involved are still not totally understood or mastered, and the technology is still in its infancy. Leading engineers in the field have stated that the electrical power required to supply an electric propulsion engine capable of accelerating an aircraft the size of the Illinois UFO would approximate the total wattage of the entire United States power grid, or about 2,200 gigawatts. By comparison, a typical nuclear reactor produces at full output about one gigawatt of electricity. On October 24, 1998, Deep Space One, the first NASA satellite utilizing an ion engine as the primary propulsion source, was launched into orbit. This video is a test of the DS-1 engine prior to launch. The video utilizes time-lapse photography because the ion engine produces a gentle accumulative thrust over a period of time. Although various EP thrusters have been tested and used on satellites by the American and Soviet space programs since the 1960s, no American mission until Deep Space One has ever depended on electronic propulsion as the primary engine because of the concern that it would not work and a very expensive satellite would be lost. Even if the Illinois UFO had a lighter-than-air quality of a blimp, Electronic propulsion is not capable of accelerating an aircraft to 3,000 miles per hour in two to four seconds. Which takes us to hypothesis number two. 
NIDS presented a theory based around Puthoff's polarizable vacuum, in which local polarizable vacuum constants are modified via some unknown technology, thus inducing controlled acceleration fields. The physicist Alcubierre theorized in 1994 that space-time itself could be potentially modified, contracting space and time ahead of an object and expanding behind it, creating a warp drive type jump through space. Yet once again, Puthoff, the proponent of the polarizable vacuum theory, said in 1997 at a NASA Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Workshop that such effects are beyond technological reach without some unforeseen breakthrough. Even in places like Area 51, it's doubtful that man has achieved that quantum leap. As a final hypothesis, some have suggested the Illinois UFO uses beamed microwave propulsion, magnetoplasma dynamics, and air spike technology. This theory contends that a ship using a helium-oxygen mix for buoyancy could collect beamed microwave energy onto a receiving rectenna from an orbiting satellite. This microwave energy is then converted to electric power, which is divided between superconducting electromagnets and the propulsion system. Propulsion would be supplied by ion engines and a newer concept called pulsed detonation propulsion. Here, the rectenna would focus microwaves to a detonation area where atmospheric air is superheated to explode creating plasma as thrust. Also, part of the microwave energy would be redirected forward of the craft, creating a superheated bubble of air, or an air spike, which would deflect the shock wave and minimize air friction. Thus, the craft would appear to make a hyperjump acceleration. In 1997, Leek Mirabeau, an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, conducted a test of a new technology under the sponsorship of the United States Air Force and NASA at the U.S. Army's high-powered laser test facility at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The technology being tested was beamed microwave propulsion. Mirabeau successfully launched a small craft 100 feet into the air. Designed by Mirabeau, the so-called light craft carried no onboard engine or fuel and was lifted into the air purely on a beam of invisible infrared light. Although the test was a phenomenal technical breakthrough, the craft was an experimental model, six inches in diameter, the size of a child's top. Mirabeau has himself stated that to apply this technology to a proposed full-scale aircraft of 66-foot diameter, it would take at least another generation. Anticipated delivery date is the year 2019. Why would the Air Force or some other government entity spend thousands of dollars in research and development in their own laboratories working on technologies that would be considered inferior if they have already achieved the technology seen aboard the Illinois UFO? The most likely answer to that question is that the UFO seen over this area on January 5, 2000 was not man-made. In November of 1989, over northeastern Belgium, 140 witnesses, including eight police officers, saw similar triangular-shaped UFOs, and the objects sped away at incredible speed. In December of 1999, near Columbia, Missouri, the same objects were seen. If the Air Force or some other unknown government entity has achieved this technology, then they should be held accountable for their actions, for they intentionally flew at low altitudes over populated areas. Whatever the UFO was, it wanted to be seen. The only question that remains is who, or what, was at the controls? The saddest statement to be made regarding this remarkable sighting of January 5th is that while the lives of several witnesses have been heavily impacted by this event, only a select number of unknown individuals with the highest security clearances know if this was truly an alien craft. Perhaps the people of our planet would like to know if we're being visited by an alien race.